Hi, everyone. We'll just give it a few more seconds. So do, are you, your kids are back in school now or they will be back in school in the fall? Oh, Steve, we are um, live in front of everyone. So you and I can keep talking about kids in just a sec. Um, but for now, I'm about to introduce you. And okay. sorry, everyone, for those who don't know, Bay Area schools remain closed and it's hard. Um, but let me go ahead and introduce our speaker. Welcome to the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. A year ago, we started these seminars remotely over Zoom. And while many of us desperately miss being on campus with our colleagues, the good thing about the seminars is we can include more people, not only among our speakers, but in our audience. So thank you for tuning in. And please visit our website to see our entire slate of spring speakers. We're gonna have these seminars every Thursday at 1130 until June 3rd. Today, we are delighted to have Steve Krasner with us. Um, if you have any questions during the course of his talk, please enter them into the Q&A box. For CDDRL people, if you'd like to unmute to ask your question, please just let me know when you're typing your question in. Steve Krasner is the Graham H. Stewart Professor of International Relations at Stanford University. He's a former director of CDDRL and an FSI senior fellow. And he's also a fellow at the Hoover Institution. From February 2005 to April 2007, he was the Director of Policy Planning at the State Department. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Today, he is going to be discussing research from two recently published issues of Daedalus that he edited with Carl Eikenberry. Steve will speak for about 30 minutes before we open it to Q&A. So Steve, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. So let me start with uh, the bottom line here, which is that getting to a, having a wealthy consolidated democracy is hard. We've kind of, I think the big mistake that many people in the United States and in general and Western Europe has made is that it's kind of part of the natural order of things. I think it actually is not that if you look at the history of the world, you know, let me see if I can, I think I will, let's see if this works. No, of course it doesn't. The buttons work before, but now let's let's see if they work. Okay, I mean, if you look at the uh, the history of the world, very few countries have actually achieved consolidated democracies. Very few countries have high, had high levels of wealth. If you look at most of human history, you know the fact is that most political systems have been exclusive, closed access, threat seeking, exploitative, and violent, and that. For those living in Western Europe or the United States, you know, being in a world, being having a world which is both where the government is both effective and constrained is a very, very unusual um, situation to be in. But for most of human history, the government hasn't been very effective and it hasn't been very constrained. Um, and even if you look at countries now, say China. You have a government which I think is very effective, but you can't argue that the um, government is very constrained. So if you look at per capita income by region, I mean, what you can see is that per capita income really only begins to pick up after 1820, after the Industrial Revolution. And before the Industrial Revolution, things were pretty stagnant. You know, life expectancy was 30 or 40 years. The Black Death, at least in the 14th century in Europe, killed up to 50% of the population in some parts of Europe, and people had no idea what was happening. And if you look back kind of a human history, you know, Nazi Germany was my lifetime. I mean, so you don't have to go back very far to find a situation in which a country with a relatively high per capita income uh, became anything but a consolidated democracy. And you can also see that most countries in the world, I mean, especially if you look at, you know, most parts of Africa, or parts of Latin America, it's been very, very hard to get to consolidated democracy. Um, there are places that were at one point in time, like Argentina, which were pretty wealthy uh, around 1900, had a per capita income, something like the uh, Western Europe, is certainly much poorer now. If you look at most of Africa, it's not that the technology is not available. It's not that there aren't enough people that are that are educated, but actually getting a hold of the technology 
and applying it has actually been a difficult and challenging thing to do. So the simple fact that you have improved technology does not mean that improved technology will, will lead to higher levels of per capita income, much less to consolidated democracy. All right, so if, I think if we think about reaching consolidated democracy, we do know from modern, modernization theory, and the argument that I'm making here is that I want to emphasize again, I think very heretical for most Americans and CDDRL. So we do know, I mean, and there's certainly a lot of research in this, that if you have higher levels of wealth and a larger middle class, you're more likely to get to a consolidated democracy. Um, Bosch at, at Princeton has done work on this in a 2011 um, APSR article, which I think is, is really excellent. I mean, he looks at the correlation between higher levels of wealth and um, democracy and find that, that that is a very strong correlation if you're looking at the period from, say, 1800 to 2000. I mean, the exceptions being the period during the Cold War when both the United States and the Soviet Union were, in, were more interested in allies than they were interested in consolidated democracies. And the second exception, which I really think is important, is that you know this relationship between the wealth and democracy is very strong up until about ten thousand dollars per capita income, and after that it kind of flattens out. So there's no guarantee that countries that were wealthy in the past um, or even wealthy now and be, will become wealthy in the future will necessarily become consolidated democracies. All right, that I think we know. The second thing, which I think is true, is that. It takes a lot of luck to have a consolidated democracy. If you look at the Spanish Armada at the end of this, at, in 1588, I mean, it was basically sent by Spain, a Catholic country, to facilitate the invasion of Britain, which was then, or, or England, which was then a Protestant country. And the Spanish Armada was not really defeated by the British, but the wind sort of blew it up up to the north. So the Spanish invasion troop, a uh, force of about 50,000 troops was never able to reach England. England at the end of the 16th century was a very divided country. I mean, Elizabeth, you know, there's this famous speech by Elizabeth I, but it, it doesn't mean that the Protestants would necessarily have prevailed. For those of you that have seen the movie Dunkirk, you know, imagine if the weather had, you know, which was actually pretty accurate. So imagine if the weather had been bad in the British Channel at the time of Dunkirk. The British would not have been able to get their, their troops plus 100,000 French troops off of Europe. They might have sued for peace with Germany. Maybe the outcome would have been the same because the United States developed nuclear weapons, but it would have been a longer and harder war. So I think if you look at even weather, if you look at luck, luck really has played a world in reaching this world of consolidated democracy. So the question then is, I think, if you look at the literature that's out there now, if we have theories of state development, I think there are really three. There's modernization theory, which I think has been absolutely dominant, has pervaded um, American policymakers, and I think also American thought. And if you look at American policy towards China, you know, the assumption was the Chinese, we would facilitate the Chinese, we, the United States, would facilitate the Chinese entering the WTO. China would become more wealthy, it would have a larger middle class, it would become more democratic, it would be just like us. Lo and behold, China ended up just being like China. So I think modernization has, a, has had a very strong hold on not on the American academic world, but also the American policymaking world. I mean, there's a second argument about institutional capacity. War makes the state and the state makes war. It's a famous aphorism from Tilly. I mean, there were also other explanations for how institutional capacity develops, including, you know, having the right colonial powers, um, having the right religion, which was mainly Calvinism. Um, so th that is sort of an alternative view that you're not going to have development unless you have a high level of institutional capacity first, even if the state is not can, constrained. 
And finally, you have this, this third argument, which is mainly an argument made by American academics, which is elite competition and bargaining, which basically says it's pretty unusual for elites to give up power. They act strategically. They're not going to give up power unless they're really compelled to give up power. Um, and there's no guarantee that you're going to get democracy at the end. So I think if we look historically um, at the period since the Second World War, there's really only one large country that's gone from being wealthy and autocratic, uh, that's gone from being poor and autocratic to being wealthy and democratic, and that's South Korea. And everything else has been failed. So when Carl Eikenberry and I did these two edited volumes, one thing that we were very interested in is what is what's happened with civil wars, what's the impact on um, the contemporary international system. So one thing is, look, the world is, div is divided into sovereign states. Sovereignty is a state system that developed in Europe over several hundred years. Um, it's not in anybody's interest to throw out sovereignty, but it's also very clear that there are other ways in which um, the international system could be, could be organized, which on the face of it, I would say make a lot more sense. So if we look at the traditional Chinese system, you had China as the central state, you had other states as tributary states, China was much bigger than other states. There was a general recognition that not all states were the same. If you look at sovereignty, it's based on, on the fact that all states are juridically equal and it's a result of being sovereign um, you, you automatically get a certain set of privileges. If you're a state leader or among the state leaders, you get diplomatic immunity, you get a certain amount of foreign aid. So sovereign, it's, you know, when it developed over time, basically, if you want it to be a sovereign state, you have to be able to defend yourself. If you look at the debris environment, you, you have a situation where there are many states that are formally sovereign, the members of the United Nations, the United Nations General Assembly especially, um, they're completely unable to defend themselves. So, you know, if you look at the period since 1945, um, you know, with a possible, possible exception of the Korean War, we haven't had a major conflict among the major powers, but there has been a lot of civil wars they peaked in the 1990s and they've sort of declined, but there were still civil wars rather than international wars. Um, so a second situation is if you, so that's one problem with the, if you look at the extent international system. A second problem that you have, which I think is really a problem is that state expectations are very high. Uh, we expect states to do a lot of things State capacity is high for some states, but it isn't that particularly high for other states. So we have uh, social security, universal education, all of these things which many states are not able to do. I mean, the third thing that's happened is I think you really have this disconnect between underlying capabilities and the ability to do harm. So if you look at 9-11 and you look at diseases, obviously we can look at COVID-19, but other diseases, nuclear weapons, which a number of pretty weak states, like North Korea has a per capita income of about around $1,000 or 1,500. The United States has a per capita income of $60,000. And yet, North Korea is or will soon be in a position where it could kill millions of Americans. And you also have cyber attacks, which as we've seen in the attack on Sony, uh, or even in this recent attack by the Russians on the United States can be pretty serious and you don't need a lot of capabilities. And finally, you know, if you look at a, a, a last contradiction, you have this world of man-made governments on the one hand versus, you know, worlds in which government is made by God. You know, so jihadists are the most obvious example of this. But if it, any of you care to listen, there is a Christian religious station which broadcasts in Northern California. Uh, and you see there are, there are many Americans that are evangelical Christians and they're waiting for Christ to return on earth. So this idea of government made by man and government made by God, while it's most obvious if you're looking at jihadists, is not necessarily the only uh, example that we have. 
All right. So what are the so I think if you look at these three theories of development, I do think that rational choice institutionalism is the most persuasive. That if you think about England as the kind of beginning of the Industrial Revolution, I mean, why did you have a government in England that was relatively effective and relatively constrained? Because there were a series of religious wars in England in, this, in the beginning of the 17th century. The, king was cut, the king's head was cut off, Oliver Cromwell, and then his son became the, the rulers of England. Um, that only lasted for about 10 years. The English realized that they couldn't get, get along without a king because they needed some centralized power. Um, and um, But if you look at what happened, you know, the Glorious Revolution of 1688, and both Parliament and the sovereign, the king, realized that they needed each, each other. And the fact that Charles I had been executed was demonstration to the sovereign that you could end up with your head being cut off. The fact that there, there actually had been no monarchy in Britain for a decade was a demonstration to the sovereign that you could lose powers. So the parliament, and, but the parliament wasn't able to govern the country effectively, so they had to bring the king back. So I think if you look at what happens um, in the 17th century, you have at least a military government which is effective and constrained. So the building of forts, the building of cannons, feeding of troops is all done by private actors. Why did that happen? Because merchants in the city of London who loaned money to the king didn't want to give the king a whole bunch of power. I mean, you don't have a, a professional police force in Britain until the beginning of the 19th century, until about 1820. So if you look at what I think we can realistically accomplish, I mean, we spent billion, I mean, the United States has spent billions of dollars in Afghanistan and in Iraq, you might be able to get security, you might be able to get health, which is certainly a big success story um, of the 20th century, but not necessarily an automatic success, success story. I know I've been protests against vaccinations in Northern Korea and in Pakistan against polio vaccination. But still, life expectancy in most countries of the world has increased by something like 30 years since 1945. That really is a big success story. Uh, if you look at child mortality, you know, you could assume that half of your kids would die in the past. I mean, it, it's much less the case now. You might be able to get some economic growth, but you're not going to get economic growth which really threatens political leaders. So if you look at Northern California, so if you went back 70 or 80 years, it was, it was fruit orchards. And now it's high technology. There are lots of people that are billions of dollars. Those people were not around before. These billions of dollars translate into political strength. Um, so, you know, it's pretty, you know, so you're creating a situation in which the government can absolutely and clearly lose power as a result of these transformatory um, uh, developments in the private sector. You know, and certainly Northern California is an example, I think it's an example of that. And if you look at the Trump administration, you see these things are, they're hard. If you're, if you grow up at a, say a farm in Iowa, uh, you were white, you were Christian, you kind of understood the United States, you thought it was your country. Um, you're suddenly confronted with a situation in which there are lots of other people, Indians, Jews, East Asians who have lots of power in the country. That's really kind of, it's not your country anymore. You know, if you look at gun control legislation, I think, and you're trying to explain it, I think, I think ideology is a much more powerful driver than economic self-interest. You look at, you know, sort of, you try to understand why many Republican men refuse to get vaccinated. Um, so I think the latest figure I saw was something like 49%. You know, I, I don't think you can explain it in terms of material self-interest. I think you have to explain it through the ideology. And the ideology was, the country used to be ours, now it's somebody else's. We want someone who's gonna make the country ours and someone is Donald Trump. Okay, so you might be able to get some economic growth, but I think economic growth, which is not going to threaten 
uh, domestic political leaders. Finally, you might get some protection of human rights. I mean, maybe. I mean, you maybe won't be able to torture people at will, but you're not going to be able to do anything which isn't in the interest of local elites. Local elites have a much clearer understanding of what's going on. They have a clearer understanding of what's going on in their own country. Um, I think it's very difficult for outsiders to get a clear understanding of what's happening. You know, if you look at Af Afghanistan, Ghani is probably as good as you could possibly hope for. Someone who has a PhD from the United States, his kids who actually went to school at Stanford. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to run the country effectively. So I think in most situations, local elites are not going to allow themselves to be in a situation where they will lose control. They'll lose control if you allow capitalism to run wild. Capitalism is likely to run wild with high levels of technological change. Um, and it's not surprising that political elites would prevent that kind of thing from happening if they possibly could. I right, finally, if you're looking at, I think, uh, the policy uh, uh, implications of this analysis, you know, it is a, you, you might have the standard, we do have a standard treatment. And the standard treatment is using UN, UN peacekeeping operations and some uh, foreign aid. But the standard treatment only works, even if you're looking at civil wars, if there is a limited amount of external uh, intervention, and if the protagonists in a civil conflict are mostly interested in material interests, not in ideological interests. So if you look at, at what the implications of this are for the United States, I think they're actually quite difficult and I'm not even sure they're implementable. Um, but they do say, look, if you look at Saudi Arabia, it's an autocratic state and it's pretty wealthy, but it's only wealthy because of oil. I mean, if you look at this recent uh, murder of Khashoggi and what they said, you know, and you see this in American policy, it's pretty clear that the Saudi government murdered Khashoggi. The implication of this argument is that, you know, the Saudi government is, good as we're is as good as we're likely to get. And we're going to have to accept the fact that they will murder people but they shouldn't do it inefficiently. I want to say this out loud because I want to make the uh, the case strongly, as strongly as I can. So you see that the implications of this are you know, pretty dire. It says that the United States, you know, it hopes to get democracy. In fact, it's not going to get democracy. It's failed to get democracy. The only place where it actually got democracy is South Korea. There are a lot of arguments about why it happened there. But in most other places, it's not likely to get this. You're most likely to be stuck with autocratic leaders. Um, so you're dealing with a situation in which, you know, if you look at most of the world, um, you know, we're unlikely to get consolidated democracies. We may get some economic growth. We may get some protection of human rights, but we're not going to get automatic, we're not going to get economic growth or protection of human rights, which is going to threaten the position of or crack rulers. All right, let me stop there and I'd be happy to try and answer any questions that you guys might have. Great, thank you so much, Steve. Um, so anyone who has any questions, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A and we'll, we have plenty of time to have a discussion with Steve. So the first question is, given that you've just edited um, these two volumes that take a deeper dive in all of the separate chapters into some elements of civil war and governance in particular, what are some broader takeaways um, from all of the different chapters about development goals and stateness in particular? Yeah, I think that, uh, that the ability of outside actors to do something is limited and that the rise of China is clearly gonna complicate things. That for a sort of brief period of time, say 1990 to 2005, the United States could sort of run the world on its own. Even then, I think it was very difficult to do because it was very difficult for the United States to understand what was happening in other countries. And then if you kind of look at what's happening at a, at a global level now, China's become a much more important actor and China is kind of, you know, loosely speaking, an alternative to the United States. So 
Chinese influence has increased. Our level of ignorance has stayed high and will remain high. Um, so I think our ability to actually get, I mean, we may get some kind of economic growth, but not economic growth, which is going to threaten political rulers. So I think the best we can do is, you know, accept the fact that we're stuck with autocracy. We may be able to get some economic growth. Economic growth will kind of improve the situation, will make it more likely that you get a transition to democracy, but there's no guarantee that that will happen. And we're very, very unprepared to do it. I mean, even if you look at the academic world, you know, if you look at the, you know, what we classify as democracy, autocracies and anocracies, I mean, it's very rough, you know, so it's, it's isn't even clear. And I must say, we didn't do that well in, a, in these two edited volumes. You know, I think in looking at you know, what are the measures that we're likely to be able to take which autocratic rulers will find acceptable? Free and fair elections, they're not going to find acceptable. You know, or they'll only find free and fair elections acceptable if it ratifies agreements which political elites have already come to. But there may be certain aspects of an electoral system or certain aspects of a, a political system what you may be able to achieve, but it's not going to be easy. So if you look at Mississippi in Guatemala, um, it was a law, which was a UN sponsored investigatory agency. So it was debated for a long period of time, strongly backed by the United States, did actually end up putting one of the leaders in Guatem of Guatemala into jail uh, at the end one of the presidents of Guatemala but was in despair the, you know, recently by a new president who, who felt threatened. So it's, it's really hard to do things which are going to threaten existing elites because you're gonna hang on to power and they have much more information than we could possibly have. Okay, so one question that we have is, what is your recommendation for how you actually in practice have the United States abandon traditional values? Uh -huh. if, you were, if, if you had your old job of director of policy planning at state, what would you actually be recommending? So look, I think that's very, let me say, first of all, it's very difficult. And if you look at American foreign policy, you know, the United States has pictured, pictured itself as this defender of democracy, defender of human rights, so abandoning that is very hard. So I don't have a good answer to the question, even though I've thought about it a lot. So I think you'd have to base American foreign policy on issues of security. I mean, if you think of Walter Russell Meade, you'd have to make American foreign policy Jeffersonian. You know, what you say is you should improve the functioning of democracy in the United States. You should emphasize American national security and Amer you know, it's going to be hard to push American ideological values. Okay. So I think it would be switching to a focus on security rather than ideological values. It's the best answer I have, but it's not a very satisfactory answer. Look, I remember very vividly at one point when I was still, um, no, I was actually out of government, but it's on the Foreign Affairs Policy Board. So we got to meet with um, uh, Clinton when she was still Secretary of State. Um, shortly before that, I'd been in Afghanistan. I visited a number of foreign aid agencies. Um, women's rights was kind of at the top of the agenda of all of these agencies. You see, I thought that Clinton knew very well that you weren't going to be able to, you were not going to get Scandinavian level women's rights in Afghanistan. But how you sell that to her constituents, I think that's a really hard and difficult question. So I think the US is really stuck, you know, in that we have defended these traditional values. These traditional values haven't worked out very well. We don't have another narrative. I think the narrative you have to go to would have to be security. Um, but it's it's a it would mean that we'd have to shift our focus and our emphasis. Okay, so I'd like to dig a little deeper on something that you suggested in this talk, which is that we have sort of two development goals. Um, one is to promote democracy and, and human rights in a lot of parts of the world. And the other is to promote economic development through the adoption of liberal, um, you know, market means and joint having countries be able to join the global, increasingly integrated global economy. 
are you saying that you think that those two goals are either at odds or that they hollow out the state in particular, that the promotion of one kind of economic development might actually disempower state actors? Okay, so I think that one kind of development, you know, could, you know, possibly, since I think these autocratic systems, basically, they exist on corruption. Corruption is very important. Um, they're not going to accept changes which make, uh, which eliminate corruption and high. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So what do we have to do? I think, you know, first of all, the United States should follow a policy where it makes trade relatively unconstricted. It should look for policies where it has domestic political support and where it can build up domestic political actors. Um, so I think we should, we can and should do that. But looking for free and fair elections is something we're not going to be able to accomplish. So I think it's pretty striking. We've had, you know, really 65, 70 years of saying, you know, we're supporters of free and fair elections, we're supporters of human rights, we think it's a great way to work. And so what I'm saying is it may be true that if you think about the mass of the population, the best thing that you could possibly hope for is having a democratic system. Um, having a government which is both efficient and constrained. What I'm saying is that it's really very hard to get that, to that. It's easier to get autocratic systems. And if you look at most of human has, history, I mean, it's, it's kind of striking. No one assassinated Stalin, much less that more kings were not assassinated in the past. And I think, you know, why did that not happen? I think it's because people recognize that you might be able to kill a king. You could kill a king easily with a sword or a knife. You know, some kings did get assassinated. Most kings didn't get assassinated. Why did they not get assassinated? Because people were worried about what came after. So I think it's, you know, the ability to sort of organize autocratic rules is fairly easy. I think people are willing to accept autocratic rule. Um, you know, often if you look at Harari's recent work, I mean, I think the, uh, you know, back by having autocratic rule back by religion was great because you thought that you made an argument about some higher power. I think those are really very strong arguments. And a situation in which you have effective elections, which as we see in the United States is not so easy to get to, uh, in which you do have effective elections and the effective elections can overthrow rulers, that's actually a very, very hard place to get to. And even in the United States, it's sort of been in a place for a relatively long period of time, you know, changed a few things in the last election and things might have turned out very differently. Okay, so um, I have a, a question about that in just a sec, but first we're getting some pushback from uh, people like Brett Carter at CDDRL who's asking about the tension between, this tension that you've noted between security and pursuing democracy sounds maybe like a retreat to a Cold War type position where we pursue alliances with foreign governments based on maybe how amenable they'll be to our goals versus others. For example, are you advocating that we should just cede ground over some autocratic areas like Central Africa to other players in the international system like China? Okay, that's a great question, Brett. Really an excellent, an excellent question. So I can say we could still mouth off about these other arguments, but if you're looking at, at Brett's work, which I actually used in my recent book, um, you know, it's pretty hard. If you're looking at, at the Central African Republic, I mean, look at how hard it's been to get in guess who out of power. Look at Brett's work. You know, why is it hard? because he sort of knows what's going on in the country. He's been able to hang on to power. So I don't think we have to actually see those places, but we have to recognize that, you know, we should put most of our effort into some of this closer to the Cold War. Um, we should try to find things which do have domestic political support, which would move you make democracy more like it. I want to say move you towards democracy because I don't think it's inevitable. But the best we can do is create a set of conditions which make democracy more likely. Are we going to get it? Is there any guarantee that we'll get it? Not necessarily. 
And I think Brett's work, if you look at guess who has been able to hold on to power for a long period of time, since 1979, I think. You know, why is that? Because he understands what the levers of power are in his own country. Okay. So um, I don't think we'd have to completely see things because I think other players will have the same kind of problems that we've had. But I think we should really change our emphasis away from the political and more towards other things which make democracy more likely. Okay, so how much of this um, types of governance, the, the outcomes that you're describing, particularly of some autocracies that just remain stable, how much of that do you think can be attributed to the general decline of the liberal international order particularly from stable democracies that have become more illiberal, Ill illiberal on certain dimensions, including ours. Um, as you know, it's been a time of sort of declining democracies worldwide. And do you think that that has also impacted? Okay, I think that's, commitment? it is a great question. So the logic of the argument is not much at all. Um, because what you were saying is, you know, having stable democracies is actually very hard. Um, it's very hard because it's incredibly disruptive. I mean, I think about my use of the example of the farmer in Iowa, but I think about a guy who was 50 years old when Germany became unified. And, you know, 50 year old in East Germany, you were just stuck. It's like being a farmer in Iowa. You're being thrown into this new system. You didn't know how the system works. You weren't able to be educated yourself. I think it's really difficult. So if you look at even the US, I mean, it's an example of how hard it is. So I think this general decline of democracy, you know, is testimony, you know, we've had very dramatic change in the way that people have lived over the last 30, well, more, say 220 years since the Industrial Revolution. You know, if you go back in the past, as I said, life expectancy was 30 or 40, most of the kids died. You had a disease like the belt. Black Death that killed a lot of people. You had zero idea of where it was coming from. So these changes have been very dramatic changes. And I would say for people, for people, very quick changes. You know, within my lifetime, if you look back to say, you know, Nazi Germany was still, you know, not, you know, Hitler was still ruling Germany when I was born. So it's only been in this recent period that you've had these relatively small number of consultants consolidated democracy. So I think this backsliding is not surprising. It's what we should expect. Um, and so keeping democracy, you know, I think all we can do, I think being a beacon of light. So I think Brett's right that, you know, it's more of a Jeffersonian policy than it's, it is a Wilsonian policy. I think backsliding in general is not so surprising because you have the these very rapid changes, people were thinking they were great, that it was their country and all of a sudden they find that it's not. I think that's really hard. Okay, um, I'm now going to ask Frank to join us and ask you a question. Uh, hey, Steve. Hi, Frank. Uh, so this is actually not a question, it's a comment that pushes back against something that you said. Um, you know, uh, the essay that I wrote for that Daedalus collection, oh. I spent a long time looking at uh, English civil wars. And the thing that struck me was how violent and unstable England was up until the glorious revolution when, well, this basically the big civil war in the 1640s and then the glorious revolution after which it became you know, almost completely stable. And uh, the thing I'm pushing back against is this idea that nobody ever tried to kill a king. Uh, you know, I, I look not just at English history, but the Ottomans and the French and, a, you know, a lot of uh, monarchies. And the thing that really struck me is that it was really, really dangerous to be in the line of, uh, of a royal succession. There was one Turkish sultan that had 14 of his brothers killed uh, when they were children so that they would not uh, be rivals to him for the throne. Uh, there was a civil war in England roughly every 50 years, uh, you know, that's the inspiration for Game of Thrones. Uh, uh, and, you know, part of the reason I started reading all this English history was I wanted to know whether the Wars of the Roses were actually as bloody as, uh, you know, as were portrayed in that HBO series. And what I learned is that they're actually bloodier. 
Uh, and so I don't think that there was anything remotely like a consensus that stability uh, was the, you know, uh, uh, kind of the, the chief end of government. Uh, and in fact, you know, Hobbes wrote Leviathan that begins this whole trend towards modern liberalism uh, in recognition that essentially you're living in a state of nature before. And if you wanted stability, what you needed were liberal rules by which you could, uh, you know, govern over diversity and peacefully resolve uh, differences. And so I think that even if you lower your sights to stability itself, I'm not sure that liberal democracy is the worst thing in the world. No, look, I think liberal democracy, so I've thought a lot about your essay. I think liberal democracy is great if you could actually get it. And it's definitely right that, you know, you know being, being a member of the nobility was, it was likely to get you killed. And, you know, people tried to figure, work out different ways of bringing some kind of stability. Like, that's what primogeniture, I think, was about. Uh, you know, the Ottomans had a different rule, ruler, so they, you know, they killed all of their brothers, so it's not unusual. So here's the problem. I think if you're looking at where this happened, so it happened in one place, it happened in England. So if you look at Hobbes, Hobbes started the Leviathan right after the English Civil War, the king's head has been cut off. So it's an argument about, you know, the Leviathan, it's an argument for stability. It's not an argument for democracy. You're supposed to give up all of your rights. You know, there's this sort of myth about the state of nature in the Leviathan. Um, but I think the fact that this happened in England was a peculiarity of English history. So I think you're right to say there's this long period of obedience, obedience to the law it was hard to do. You know, when James I became the King of England, he was prior to the King of Scotland, they had a different legal system. And, you know, he never sort of accepted the English legal system, you know, and, his, and Charles I had his head getting cut off. But I think it was the fact that Charles I's head was cut off. And then the, the English, you know, they, they tried to rule without a king for a decade. That's what the Cromwells were about. And they were unsuccessful. So Parliament learned that you, you actually needed a king if you wanted to have some, some sort of stability. The king learned that he could also get his head cut off. And that was, I think, the prelude to 1688. So I think this sort of long evolution is true. It's not a guarantee. You know, I, I agree with you totally that, that um, demo democracy, you're likely to have order if you have a democratic system, and it's great if you're living in a democracy. But if you have a chance to seize power, you get prestige, you get money. Um, it may be an extremely dangerous thing to do, but it's still something that you, I think, you know, if you look at what's happened historically, it's something that's happened. And I think what happened in Britain was, was very peculiar. I and mean, I was lucky. Uh, well, we, uh, we can continue this discussion. <laughs> Later, but I, I don't think uh, it is uh, peculiar. But uh... well, you but you still have to. I mean, if you're looking at the development of not only wealth and democracy, where do you have it? In some parts. Yeah, of no, no, but first of all, I'm not talking about. I'm talking about liberalism more than democracy. You know, liberalism meaning rules uh, that you have a constitutional order uh, that defines you know things like succession and how you choose uh, leaders and what the you know, what the English did after 1688 was not to say, oh, we're just gonna turn everything over to the king who's gonna rule like an autocrat. Right. What they did was to say, no, we have a constitution uh, and a, a, you know, a system for uh, restraining the power of the king. No, look, I don't disagree with that. So, and, and one thing, let me, let me confess my ignorance. Um, I think we need a more refined understanding of what we can get and what we can't. Now, it may be that it's exactly right that if you have a rule of law, that might be actually something that a lot of people would buy into. And would kind of, you know, because the sort of veil of, you know, if you're operating behind a veil and there is a rule of law might be a good thing. There might be some kind of electoral systems that are better than others, but not necessarily a free and fair election may be better than an election maybe better than a system where you have no elections at all. So I think what we need is, you know, is an, some understanding of what we can accomplish. And I think the key here is we have to be able to identify actors in countries that would back change that we're in favor of. 
And I think that's from the outset, that's kind of hard to do, but not impossible. So having liberalism rule of law, having some kind of elections, not necessarily free and fair elections, might be, might be what we should aim for if we're thinking about having an effective foreign policy. But having a foreign policy in which countries would become you know, fully consolidated democracies and wealthy, maybe what I'm arguing is that that's probably a step too far. Um, I'd like to ask for specific examples, given recent um, coups in Myanmar, for example, and the ongoing sort of incursions on Hong Kong by mainland China, people typically want democracy, which you know, um, and will struggle for it. So what could the United States do that would be in both its security interests and also tapping into the domestic constituencies that you've said would in theory be helpful um, in order to achieve not full democracy in either of those places, but at least not full autocracy? All right, so I don't know, let me say first that I don't have a great answer to that question, but I, what I would say is this, that trying to make everybody just like us is a fool's errand but that there might be some kind of policies that we could pursue, for instance, like open trade, in which we would develop a domestic interest group, which would be in favor of that. I think Frank's right to say that if you think about rule of law, and rule of law is a good thing, and, and there may be a lot of people that buy into it because without rule of law, they themselves are very vulnerable. But I think it means thinking about things that would be acceptable to political elites and things that would have domestic constituencies, which is not necessarily full and consolidated democracy. Okay. Um, and finally, there's a question about corruption and rent seeking um, and how that ties into governance. So you've said that autocracies, you know, rely on corruption, but at this point, there are many opportunities for rent seeking in democracies as well, um, and international financial sort of organizations and networks that allow for more concentration of economic wealth and power in fewer hands. So how would you describe that relationship of rent seeking and corruption in, in the contemporary world with forms of non-democratic rule? All right, so I think, I think it's right to say, but you know, look at how, I mean, corruption is pervasive. It costs, it, it, it costs something like four times as much money to build a subway in New York than it does in Paris. Why is that? You know, if you look at governors in Illinois, you know, I forget, four out of the five most recent governors have ended up in jail. So this corruption is pervasive. So I think the idea is that we're not gonna be able to get rid of all of it. Now, the question is, I so I think some kind of corruption better than others. So I think patronage is better than having a situation in which the guys that are ruling the country simply steal money. So if you look at Afghanistan, you know, Karzai and his buddies stole like $800 million from the Bank of Afghanistan or the Bank of Kabul, whichever it was. And, you know, used the money to buy, money to buy villas in, in Dubai. And it was of no help to Afghanistan. If you look at the PRI, they were very committed to having a situation in which they did use patronage. We don't like, you know, what patronage is saying is you vote for us, we're going to give you political payoffs. Patronage isn't so easy because you have to be able to monitor people effectively, but it's not impossible. But it's better to have patronage than it is to have gross theft by people in power. So I think eliminating corruption entirely is impossible, but there is some possibility of, you know, some kinds of corruption better than others. I think patronage is actually better than gross theft. You know, it may not be as good as a situation which is not corrupt, but it's very, very difficult to see, get to a situation which is completely uncorrupt. Right. So I think corruption right. is just pervasive. Okay. Well, thank you, Steve, so much for your presentation. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We look forward to reading these issues of Daedalus and um, look forward to your ongoing work on this topic. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye, Didi. Thanks so much.